the lecture series uh, would not have been possible uh, without support from uh, our major sponsors, G. Unger Vettelson Foundation, the R. I. Honors Program, and the R. I. Graduate School of Oceanography, as well as from sustaining sponsors of the Honors Program, all of the colleges at URI, URI's Heritage School of Communications uh, and Media, uh, the offices of the President, the Provost, uh, and the Vice President for Administration and Finance and Classroom uh, Media and Services. Some rules, cell phones off or in the vibrate mode, uh, and Judith's special rule, for those of you who don't already know it, open candy wrappers or any other rustling things that you now have, open them now. Don't, don't open in the middle if they're going to bug your neighbors. Uh, exits are in the back, uh, on the sides, in the front, and in the top. Restrooms are in the lobby and downstairs. For future events, go to uri.edu slash hc for honors colloquium. Uh, and I want to announce a special event that will take place uh, Monday, uh, next Monday evening at 7 p.m., same location here. Uh, but it'll be physicist and futurist Michio Kaki uh, will deliver uh, the lifespan keynote address at the University of Rhode Island's 15th annual diversity week. Uh, and the talk is entitled Towards a Multicultural, Scientific, and Tolerant Future of the Planet. Uh, Michio Kaki is a, is a futurist, uh, like, very much like the ones that we've had in this series here. So this talk will really, his talk will really dovetail in very well with the series, and I encourage you all to attend it. Following this um, evening's lecture, the speaker will answer questions from the audience. And we have three different ways that you can submit questions this week. Uh, you can submit them on cards. Uh, and what you'll do is you'll hand the cards to the center aisles, and the person in the center aisles will put them on the floor. So write your question on the cards, hand them to the center aisles, and the student will pick them up around 8, 10 or so, and then again when the lecture finishes. You can also text your uh, question to 401-284-7444. Uh, and I'll repeat that for the people coming in online. We have several. <laughs> can you hear me better now? Hello. <laughs> So do I have to start all over again? <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I was talking about questions. It's funny, because I can hear this hissing coming back, so it sounds like I'm fine. So I apologize. Um, so you can either write questions on cards. There are cards handed out. If you look on the back of those cards, it has the instructions printed, as well as a phone number that you can text the questions to. Uh, and uh, you can email the question to HC for honors colloquium question at gmail.com. And if you do any of those three things, the questions will end up in some form electronically, and I'll eventually get them, and I'll present them to the speaker at the end, one by one. Uh, try to keep your questions short. Shorter is better. At least it's easier for me to understand them and ask them. Uh, and try to keep one question per card, uh, so that'll make it easier for us. Following this event, uh, Werner Vinge has agreed to do a book signing. That'll take place out in the lobby. Uh, the books are for sale out there. You might have bought, yeah. bought one on the way in. He'll sign it at the end, or you can buy one at the end. So tonight, uh, Don Hayes, the Hayes uh, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Rhode Island, will introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, Don came to URI in 2007 from the University of Vermont, where he was dean of the Rosenstiel, I'm sorry, the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. I'm an oceanographer, and there's a Rosenstiel School, and so the brain goes off sometimes. Uh, he received his PhD in forest genetics from Michigan State University and is currently past president of the National Association of University Far Forest Resources Program a member of the Board of Natural Resources, the National Association of State Universities and Land Grant Colleges, and he was recently a member of the Vermont, of, of the Vermont Governor's uh, Commission on Climate Change. So Don, take it away. Thanks, Peter. 
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third in the series of the Honors Colloquium on Are You Ready for the Future? And I should just put another plug in. This is the 49th consecutive Honors Colloquium at the University of Rhode Island, which is very, very exciting to 49 years in a row of doing this. By way of introducing our speaker, let me give you something to think about just for a moment. In the next couple of decades, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. Shortly after, the human era will have ended. That is a quote from Verna Vinge's essay written several years ago called The Coming Technological Singularity. I'm sure he'll be talking about that subject tonight along with some other stimulating ideas for the future. You should also know that Verna Vinge's science fiction writing deals with coming changes in technology and the implications they have for humanity. Yes, Mr. Vinge is a science fiction writer, but he's also a professor emeritus uh, in computer science from San Diego State University, very well known as an award-winning science fiction writer. Uh, including novels such as A Fire Upon the Deep, A Deepness in the Sky, his more recent novel is Rainbow's End, and very soon, within just a week or two, he just told me, his new book will be out entitled Children of the Sky, which was actually mentioned in last week's colloquium. I just learned that he too is an alum of Michigan State University, as am I. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please welcome our speaker this evening, Mr. Verna Vinge. And they got me. You were wired. Of course. <laughs> well, thank you, Provost DeHaze. Uh, it's a uh, a real pleasure and an honor to be uh, invited here to the uh, Honors Colloquium. Um, title of my talk is uh, uh, Using Your Imagination. And I have several uh, main topics that I, that I want to cover in, in this talk. Um, and some of these are very much the uh, the situation that is described in, in, the, uh, in the abstract or the brief that you all saw. I'd like to talk about the role of science fiction uh, in thinking about the future, and then in particular how science fiction writers uh, deal with the future. And then finally, well, I'll get into the singularity stuff more explicitly, uh, how science fiction in thinking about the future uh, may evolve in the future. Uh, First of all, simple look at the, the proper place of science fiction. Uh, I was a child in the 1950s, and I remember being um, uh, annoyed and disappointed that most of the stories that I saw or, or read or that I saw on television or heard on the radio, I did listen to a lot of radio drama, um, showed, that the world, showed the world at the end of the story that really was the same as the world was at the beginning of the story. Um, and th there were cheater stories. I'd occasionally find a story that, it was, that talked about the world having been changed, and then at the end of the story, it turned out all to have been a dream on the part of the uh, principal character. Uh, I regarded that as a cheat. But on rare occasions, I would find a story where um, the world itself was really changed at the end of the story. And after a while, when this, when this happened, these rare finds, uh, uh, I realized, were mostly called science fiction. And from that point on, I was uh, hooked uh, a, a, as, as a reader and eventually as a, as a, as a would-be uh, writer. Well, by the late 20th century, uh, the notion of accelerating change has become an essential part of um, the planning wisdom of mo most of the people in the developed world, uh, countries of the world. Um, and nowadays, science fiction is not hard to find. In fact, depending on how generous you are with the definition, um, 
it, it is it is certainly all over in the in in, in video and and, and movies uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, also in 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 books not quite so much in, in books uh, the science fiction that I really like and that originally got me hooked on science fiction is still there it's bigger than ever before although it's actually quite a small percentage of the total amount of things that are called science fiction science fiction nowadays is um, mocked. It was mocked in the 1950s too. I can remember the Beanie Propeller articles that Life Magazine did every time there was a science fiction, a world science fiction convention. But science fiction is also respected nowadays. In fact, I think I think the proper way of looking at um, at uh, at uh, science fiction is that it is uh, to, to 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 humanity much the same thing it, it, that dreaming is for the individual. Uh, human in, in both good and, and useless ways. Um, so elements of the analogy are that uh, both dreams and science fiction are often nonsense. Um, they are also often amusing or frightening. And occasionally they are inspiring or, or uh, a prophetic. And just as with dreams, there's a, a variety of opinions about whether the prophecy is, is just a, a random success uh, at predicting or, or whether it is, there, there is something uh, more going on in, in the head of the imaginer. And there's also another feature that happens that's sort of related to uh, inspiring and prophetic, and that is sometimes you wake up for a dream with a sudden, sudden very unpleasant realization that you've been overlooking some serious uh, uh, threat. The science fiction writer Ray Bradbury was once asked if he wrote um, science fiction to predict the future. And I paraphrase his response, but his, his, his reply was, oh no, I, I write science fiction to prevent it. <laughs> well, one thing that I often get asked is, uh, where do you get those crazy ideas? And um, it actually turns out that among science fiction writers, there's kind of a saying or a general belief uh, that ideas are cheap, that, that they're everywhere, and that, in fact, the difficult part is uh, executing and presenting those ideas um, in a story in such a way that, that people really want uh, to read the story. And I have two main methods for dealing with the ideas in stories. Um, uh, and, and one of these, I think, goes back almost to the beginning of my writing. Um, I actually was interested in writing science fiction from about the third grade. And I, I think I first sold a, a story that I began uh, writing the, the year that I got out of, uh, out, out of high school. Uh, so this actually does go back uh, a long way for me. The other method is, uh, is, is one that actually was sort of uh, su suggested to me. Um, and you'll see, and when I talk about it, you'll, you'll, you will see the, the sort of places that it came from. However, for both of these methods, a, a really critical part of the method is that I be alert to events uh, around me and constantly uh, speculate on the consequences and the, and, and the peculiarities of, of the things that are going on around me. Um, there's a common saying uh, among those who do literary criticism of science fiction, and that is that all these stories, any particular story, is just a mirror of the present. And if you look at famous science fiction stories, uh, you can kind of you, you can you can see evidence for that. I think the assertion is true, but it's really not nearly as valuable uh, an insight as the people who say it uh, think it is. And what's more accurately true is that science fiction stories are a um, uh, a mirror on the writer's present, the writer's present era. And actually, different people have different, different visions of what's going on in, in the world. When I was a kid in the 50s and a, a, a student and a young writer in the 60s, uh, the world I had been living in was full of rockets and ray guns and uh, also full of, of reading about science and reading about astronomy. And so I was surrounded by I, ideas that were not in the general stream. So this wasn't because I was a, an especially a, a, smart person. It was just what I had chosen to surround myself by. And so the water that this fish, that is myself, was swimming on 
swimming in was full of all these ideas, and it is not surprising that I was able to uh, write stories about them. Um, now, this um, also means then that it's not surprising, though, that the stories could be quite different from what most people were seeing in the 1950s and the, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, my, my first I, I, uh, mechanism for managing ideas is something that I call the idea box. And um, originally, this was actually a uh, box of three by five cards, um, a physical uh, box. Nowadays, with computers, it's uh, uh, actually just a file. And so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are, are more um, virtual than, than actual. Um, and the, the sorts of things that would make it onto these cards in my idea box uh, are, are listed here. It's actually a pretty complete list. One would be observations about personalities and situations in my everyday life. Um, and actually, as you might guess, the most embarrassing moments were almost always the ones that were the best for including in, in, in that category. Um, then there were observations about political and social oddities. Occasionally, actually, my own dreams would, would m m make it into the idea box. That didn't happen real often. Um, but in, there are actually some stories that I eventually wrote that um, uh, important parts of them came from uh, 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 dreams. And so, for instance, um, uh, 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 the Peace War came from a dream that I had uh, in, in which um, uh, the Mafia had uh, discovered how to make force fields. And they raised their ambitions much higher than they have now, and they essentially took over the world. Um, and unfortunately for them, they didn't realize one critical feature of the, of the force fields. And so the story in my dream was about uh, their confronting this mystery about what it, the thing that had given them world domination. And that much actually survived in, into the book, e even though the, the book is actually, uh, ha has a lot more in it. Um, of course, one thing I think you might expect is just the writers sitting down and, and occasionally uh, thinking of, well, what if such and such was true? Uh, notice that these activities I'm talking about are, are things that just I, 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 I do and they don't take me very much effort. Uh, the individual story ideas aren't really big enough to make stories, but uh, uh, it doesn't take me any effort to, to, to set them down. One example of a what if was I, I thought um, the concept of original sin is very big for many people. Uh, could there be a, a, a alien race that had a more intense concept of original sin than humans have. Uh, and that immediately raises two questions. What conceivable thing would make it possible for a race to have a more intense feeling about original sin, and how would that affect their society? So that would just, could just sit by itself in the idea box. Uh, I have some other ones here. You know, uh, uh, one very important thing is, is that I uh, consistently look at magazines like Science and Nature, and when I see things there, I, I, uh, I, I write them down and, and, and try to keep uh, uh, keep track of them. Um, magazines like Science and Nature are terrific for that, and the type of science fiction that I write, hard science fiction, which is supposed to take into account the hard sciences, which I include biology actually, um, uh, is a type of science fiction where reading those magazines is, uh, is very useful. There's a science fiction writer named Bruce Sterling who uh, is a great writer. And he wrote a very amusing essay about an additional feature you can get by reviewing uh, uh, issues of science. And that is looking at the advertisements. Because the advertisements are, are written by marketing people who, who want to say things that are funny. They, want, they actually want to tell a story. They want to be remarkable and fantastic. And they are targeting a highly technical audience. Um, so uh, those, those, those ads themselves are e extreme flights of fancy that are both, both amusing and, and suggestive to anybody who wants to look at them uh, 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 seriously. I also look at, at fragments, or I consider fragments of, of other stories that did certain things for me. Um, and oftentimes these other stories are ones that I actually wrote, but whether or not they're by, by, my, by myself, uh, looking at ideas that I've seen elsewhere uh, in, in that way is important. So this list of stories is accumulating. And um, there's, a, there's a, one classic theory of create, a machine creativity. 
uh, that is that uh, you could make a creativity machine um, if you had two automatic processes that were both very fast. One is um, a, a method of, of uh, generating uh, ideas very fast. And the critical thing about it and the reason why you might be able to do it with a machine is the ideas don't have to be right. They, you just have to, there just has to be a variety of them and you have to be able to generate them very fast. And the, the other mechanism would run as a coroutine for the first one. The other, the other mechanism is a bogosity meter. And it is able to scan an idea and very quickly say, this is a bogus idea, this is not a bogus idea, this is 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 a bogus idea. Um, and you just run those together. And in a way, the idea box uh, it, it has some elements of that. When it comes time for me to actually write a story, um, I uh, take the idea box out and I play an interesting form of solitaire. And that is, I will go through the idea box and I will pile up stacks of ideas that my intuition tells me might have some connection. Um, and I can do that pretty quickly because I'm not trying to exercise critical, like a, a critical uh, Im imagination on it. I'm just, just sort of doing it off the top of my head. And then I look at each of those stacks of ideas and try to imagine some way that they could, um, they could uh, uh, be logically connected. This automatically gives you stories that will cause readers to say, whatever caused you to do X together with Y? Uh, uh, it doesn't answer the question of how to write good stories, but it does, does answer that aspect of, of creativity. Um, so for instance, and this is a somewhat synthetic example because at this point I don't really remember the details. When it came to that original sin story idea, I also had an idea in my story box, which is uh, uh, a, 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 an idea about a, a really crazy uh, natural history that a certain animal had in, in a story that it was a non-sentient, pestiferous animal uh, about the size of a big roach um, that uh, Bob Silverberg and Randy Garrett had written about in the 50s. By the way, if you are interested in, in truly bizarre races, uh, you can trump almost everything that appears in science fiction stories just by going down to your neighborhood library or, or your scientific libraries here at URI and, um, and looking up uh, the the life cycles of small arthropoda. They do weird, gross, obscene, perverse things. It's stuff that you actually couldn't get in a story because it's too gross. I'm not talking about spiders eating their mates. I'm talking about really seriously deviant behavior. Um, so it was, uh, you know, putting those together actually gave me a terrific story. I, I had a reason why these people should feel guilty about themselves. And then I also had theories about what original, the, the role of original sin in industrial societies, which is, you know, a, a separate range of ideas, but it all, it all fit. Um, the other method that I said was, was more formal and it actually, uh, I, I don't think I, I came upon it in any original way, it was probably suggested to me, and it, it may very well have been suggested to me by Peter Schwartz. Peter used to hire, Peter and Global Business Network used to hire me to be a, a loose cannon when they would get together for their consulting sessions. It's always good to have a science fiction writer there, you know, he may sa say something awesomely stupid, but it's going to shake up all the experts, that, all the specialist experts that you, that you brought in to talk about the things. So I saw it's Peter's talk last week and I thought it was a great talk. Um, he's a pioneer in using the technique. and. Um, He's a pioneer in explaining it, too, so I'm not going to try too hard to re rehash what he said. But forecasting particular outcomes um, uh, or predicting particular, out particular outcomes is often just a way of getting yourself embarrassed. Uh, and at worst, it gets you into a situation where, where you uh, make fatal mistakes. And he had his, his uh, I, th I think he did his example at Royal Dutch Shell and how they, they had scenarios that turned out to be right. They were crazy scenarios, but they were right. And that alerted the Royal Dutch Shell people to be looking in the right spot when the, when the world began to go, surprisingly enough, began to go, go the way of the surprising uh, result. So a set of extreme and, and well thought out scenarios can help us with what Peter Schwartz calls the inevitable uh, surprises.
Now, science fiction writers can use scenarios as the framework for drama. Um, so this is a way, this is a, a framework that you can hang the, your ideas on and, and, and connect them. And so there is a pretty obvious connection uh, with uh, scenario-based planning. On the other hand, uh, drama um, and romance, uh, th this sort of thing has obvious weaknesses when it comes to uh, serious planning that people are going to pay you for and, and, and try to, to use to uh, have success in the real world. On the other hand, I think actually the science fiction way of doing scenarios has some very peculiar and very serious uh, uh, virtues um, compared to uh, scenario-based planning, and, I, uh, and I, I, I want to talk about that eventually. First, I want to talk a little bit about the secrets of the profession. Uh, every profession, I'm, I'm convinced, journalists, police, so on, your favorite profession, teachers, um, they all have their little secrets. And actually, they're not really secrets because uh, they're, they're exploited and explained and, 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 and accused um, in, in, in all sorts of places. The, the little secrets that police officers have is, are exploited in, in all sorts of dramas, and so we all, we all know about them. But it is true that a, a profession has to have certain things about the way they look at, look at stuff, and, and, and some of those they may, uh, may not be situations where they uh, uh, feel like going around and blatting it out all over the place. Um, and some of the secrets of science fiction writing have relevance, I think, to this talk. Now, I'm going to make a little list here of such secrets, um, and I didn't go around and, and uh, interview my fellow science fiction writers to make this list, so really this is just uh, uh, my uh, opinion. I'm just speaking for myself. But one of these secrets is that for a full-time writer, a commercial success is actually a priority goal. And uh, I, I say this even though I think that there are full-time writers who, do not, who seriously do not, do not believe that about themselves. But um, uh, nevertheless, I think it is true. If you're, if you're trying to actually make a living, um, that uh, having, uh, ha having commercial success, however much you may talk about the artistic value of what you're doing, and however much you may talk about, its, about it being visionary, um, that uh, writing an inter entertaining story, entertaining or, gr or uh, grabbing, uh, enough to get people to come in and buy the story is, uh, is, is really uh, a, a high priority. Um, at the same time, um, most science fiction writers uh, realize that uh, if they're going to talk about the future, and most science fiction does talk about the future, that it's not, it's not a, a, a hard and fast rule, but uh, most science fiction does talk about the future, centered on the future. If you do that, um, you are going to say things that uh, don't turn out to be true. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the, it's one of the perhaps, I guess, secretly frustrating things about writing science fiction is that you know, to, compared to other things, the things that are called serious literature, uh, that as time passes, you're going to have a lot more trouble competing with the stories that did not claim to be talking about the, the future, the stories that were, that, that were frankly in the here and now or, or that were historical uh, uh, stories about historical events. Um, so even if there are no immediately laughable errors in, in what you're writing, uh, that, that's a problem. Uh, we science fiction writers actually have uh, a group of tricks uh, for handling that, and, and uh, they are our form of uh, future-proofing uh, uh, tools. And I, I could give you a list of them, but you know they're secrets. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, there's, there's things like um, uh, it's much more important to talk about what something is than how it is done. And this is something that the early science fiction writers, around 1900, there was only one science fiction writer who I found, there was only one science fiction writer who uh, knew that. Instead, you'd get these stories that would go on and on and on about how things were done. But think about it. If you were going to fly to San Diego tomorrow and you had to write a little, a little essay about what you did, you'd probably say, well, I drove up to Providence and then I, and then, um, I took a flight um, uh, to San Diego and I stopped in Las Vegas along the way. Um, that doesn't tell anybody anything except the important part. 
And if, if it were a science fiction story that were written in 1900, you could easily write the sentence so it might have revealed something that it took less than a day to do that. But you didn't talk anything about the screaming speed of your arcing trajectory across the continent or about the four steam engines that were pedaling madly to turning paddles to you know, make your wings flap faster so you could get to San Diego faster. You sort of wiped the slate clean of all those errors that you would otherwise make. Um, the writer I'm thinking about from the turn of the century was Richard Kipling. And uh, he, he wrote a series of science fiction stories called the ABC stories, Air Board of Control stories. And he was very good about that. I mean, they're dirigible. These are pretty clearly dirigibles. They're not uh, uh, very few winged aircraft. But in, in other ways, he just, it, it, he just uh, handles that uh, extraordinarily well. So that, that is a, a major, a major uh, powerful tool for getting a, a future, a future proofing. And at the same time that you're trying to uh, be plausible and working as hard as you can to be plausible, um, there are probably going to be things about your story that are frankly over the top, that are, are, are not plausible and that you might not be able to make them be plausible. And um, uh, uh, Peter Schwartz said an example of that last week, at least from his view. He said, you know, these jetpacks in Minority Report, we recommended against those because it, it really is over the top. But uh, management wanted to have them in the, in the show, so the jetpacks went in. Um, so there may be things like that. And actually, there's a, there's a saying among science fiction writers and, and science fiction uh, uh, critics, um, which is that uh, you're allowed one crazy piece of, of uh, made-up magic per story. Uh, and that is honored in the breach uh, uh, more, more than it, uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is honored in any other way. But it actually does suggest something, and that is you work as hard as you can to make the stuff plausible. Uh, you, you, if you lose on that, you, you're really in bad way. But if you have to have something that is really crazy, you go and do it, you do the best you can with it, and you then go and make that as consistent with you as you can with the rest. So I wrote a story called um, The Whitling, one of the second novel that I ever uh, wrote. And in it, I, I made the assumption that I had people who could teleport, you know, disappear in one place and appear in another place. Uh, and I said, OK, magic assumption, psionic power, blah, blah, blah. But I said, let's do it, and let's, not viol let's violate as little as we can of the rest of the things that we presently know about the universe. So let, if it's going to be psionic, let's, let's it be done with, with, a, with minimum uh, energy expenditure. So you have to go across equipotential. You, know, you have to stay on an equipotential. Um, I don't want to violate linear momentum. I don't want to violate angular momentum. I don't want to violate thermodynamics. Um, I found actually it was impossible for me to do all those things at once. <laughs> but I did everything I could. And as a result, it drove the story. For instance, if you don't want to violate conservation of linear momentum, that means you come out going the same velocity that you were when you started. And it turns out, and it's easy to do the arithmetic, if you teleported more than 20 miles east or west of where we're standing here, you would be lucky to survive. You would probably break both legs. Just because as the Earth turns, the, it, going east or west by that far, the, the uh, vector is different enough that you're, you're looking, I think, at a 20 or 30 mile per hour jolt when you emerge. At the same time, you could go to South America on our meridian here in Kingston, but south latitude the same as our present north latitude. And, and it would be totally imperceptible, assuming you came out you know, you, you didn't, didn't try to do things like change, change your gravitational altitude. Um, so that drove the story plot. I, 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 trying hard in that way meant that, that everything about the alien race suddenly uh, made, a, made a whole lot of uh, uh, sense. Um, however, these two problems that I've just talked about have an overarching solution. And it's a solution that um, 
at, you could call it a secret if you want, but it's a secret that giving it away will not, will, will, will not undermine the science fiction writing profession because although the, the most important way of satisfying these two problems um, is, there, is, is there and it can be said in just a few words, it's just awesomely hard to do. Uh, and that is the last point here. The most important uh, 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 way of dealing with these last two problems is to write a story that's so darn entertaining that the readers forgive you and work with you to make, uh, make, make things right. Um, this, uh, let's call this the willing suspension of disbelief. Um, and it may not seem to be relevant to the thinking about science fiction. In fact, it's a very dangerous thing to depend on because the flip side of this is if you haven't made things sufficiently realistic and, and consistent or you haven't written a good enough story, then the readers will tear you apart. Uh, they will go to the ends of the earth to, to, to show that everything you said in the story is wrong. Uh, and they're usually right. I mean, because if you think hard enough about a story, you can, you can uh, uh, pick holes in it. Um, this is a place where this, I think uh, I can make the point of a serious planning value with science fiction. It's also the reason I chose the title of the talk, Using Your Imagination. Um, and that is the fact that more than any other art form, the written word uses imagination and creativity of the observer, that is the reader, um, as a display device. And if the story is accepted by the reader, and if the reader falls in love with the story, then that means you have at your, at your, that is at the writer's disposal, all the range of experience and imagination of that reader. And that, that is an extremely powerful tool, and um, it means that if you can succeed with that, which comes from the various things that I'm talking about and, and really doing your best with the story, uh, that the writer has a kind of leverage that's not available to the nonfiction uh, uh, creators of planning scenarios. Uh, and this actually, uh, occasionally I, I, I run into this uh, uh, full on, um, and that is I will, um, I will run into a, a science fiction reader of one of my stories who, um, actually one of the ni nice things about writing science fiction is you get to meet all sorts of uh, cool people that you might not have had an opportunity to talk to otherwise. Occasionally I run into someone that their specialty is the thing that is, 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 is something in my story. And they really liked my story. Uh, and so they've been spending all their, and their IQ is like 40 points higher than my IQ. And they've been spending all this time thinking about the story. and say, oh, I really love this story. And I noticed on page 245 where you saw this fact about such and such and the implications it has for X, Y, and Z. I say, oh, yes. Well, you're very insightful to see that, sir. Um, from a coldly um, objective point of view, I, uh, by the way, I don't mean to demean myself. I also do do all sorts of cool things in my stories. Yeah. And you probably can't get me to admit which ones I didn't do. Um, but what, what this means is you've got something there um, that actually embraces and recruits and entrains um, larger groups of genius. And that, that actually, I, I would argue, is, is something that uh, uh, would be uh, useful uh, in general. Uh, and it is, it, is, it is one thing that I, I think actually tickles a, a feature of scenarios that is especially important, and that is the, the surprise angle. Um, uh, James, John Stith wrote a story about where his what-if assumption was entirely absurd, and that is, what if the speed of light was 10 meters per second? You know, that means that if you run fast, you're going to be able to see relativistic effects. There's all sorts of reasons why that is seriously absurd and off the, off the wall. But if it, if it actually somehow got somebody to thinking about that, who really does know special relativity, um, uh, or say, just studying special relativity, it could produce insights that had not existed before. 
Similarly, if you talk about a certain sort of disaster, and it's not a sort of disaster that is showing up on anybody's trend curve plots, um, if a bright person who does deal with those threats is reading the story, and they're desperately trying to make sense of this absurd thing that you have said, you actually have created a situation where the specialist may see something hiding in the dark that uh, uh, would, have, would have remained hidden. Um, I actually have more, tr more trouble with a trend curve uh, analysis for forecasting than uh, a lot of people. I think, I think that there are problems with trend curves, and I highly recommend uh, uh, Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Squan. Uh, I think the things that he's saying there are, are absolutely essential to our present situation with regard to planning. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's the sort of thing that a lot of people agree with, and then they go off and continue doing the very stupid things that uh, Taleb is complaining about. So um, the more people who can read that book and take it very, very much uh, to heart and look, if you're a specialist type person, and look at the way you're using statistics um, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and trend curves and stuff like that, uh, the more likely it is that w we can avoid some really uh, uh, terrible uh, uh, surprises. Well, my last uh, general topic here um, was uh, to talk about science fiction in the future. So uh, that's a sort of a recursive thing, since in order to talk about science fiction in the future, I have to have a certain future in mind, uh, and I do. Uh, the particular scenario that I want to talk about uh, is the technological singularity. Um, it's uh, uh, the one I've been thinking about a lot, and that by itself actually reveals something about the, 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 uh, a weakness of scenario-based planning uh, as, it, as it exists uh, nowadays. And that is we all have our, uh, the person who's doing scenario-based planning may talk about entertaining vastly different scenarios. Um, uh, in, in order to keep track of the uh, possibility of these uh, particular inevitable surprises. Uh, on the other hand, we all have our favorites. And those are the ones where we spend most of our time. I actually spend most of my time uh, looking at, at, at technological singularity possibilities, uh, and in some cases, reverse to that. Um, and um, as, as a result, I'm, I think I actually am uh, um, pretty knowledgeable about those uh, standard possibilities. Uh, there are people in this audience who probably have other pet scenarios. It's really important that uh, we actually acknowledge that fact that it's, it's, you're probably not going to find anybody who, ex except for rare cases, I think Peter Schwartz comes close to being able to entertain radically different uh, scenarios seriously. Uh, but for most of us, we probably have one or two pet scenarios that we're spending most of our time on. Um, this is where having the human race, that is having a lot of people who are, who are educated and creative and engaged and, and communicating, this is where this becomes very um, important that they all be considering, uh, uh, be willing to consider scenarios and not being, and not being uh, entrained uh, for, for one particular scenario. Science fiction helps with that since we write so many crazy stories. Um, and they're not all about the singularity. Um, but my scenario for the future here that I want to talk about is that we do have the technological singularity. And I was talking to the honors class this, this afternoon, and one question I put to them was to define the technological singularity. Um, I want to give my definition, because there actually are at least two definitions floating around, and they're, they're, they're significantly different, even though, even though they may sound a lot alike. Uh, I'm, what I call a singularity is uh, um, the arrival or the creation um, of creatures of superhuman intelligence, that we, we as humans, we either create or become such things using technology. Now, I think actually that's an appropriate name for this sort of event um, because of an, an, another feeling I have about it. And that is, if you're talking about creatures that are of superhuman intelligence, um, you're talking about a game-changing event that is different from other, other, other game-changing events. Uh, sometimes when I talk about the singularity, people quite rightly say, but wait, the invention of fire qualifies as a singularity if you just mean a drastic change in rules. Uh, the invention of the printing press or agriculture counts as a singularity. 
Uh, that's fine. I'm not, you know, if that's the definition, I, I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. But there is this distinction when you're talking about superhumanly intelligent critters. And the sort of little example I use for that is that of any previous technological advance, even though the results were unpredictable, validly unpredictable, you could have described those outcomes to predecessor humans. So you could describe the consequences of the automobile to somebody from 1800. Uh, and they might not believe you, you know, the stuff about the superhighways and, and, and things like that. But you could explain it to them, and they would understand it. You could not do such an explanation to a goldfish. So looking forward to this particular technological uh, event, uh, I think it is qualitatively different than um, uh, technolog all technological advances um, of the past. And so as a metaphor, the word singularity is, is actually pretty, pretty cool and important. It, it, the, the analogy or the metaphor being with uh, uh, singularities, that is, black holes in, in um, relativity theory, where there's only certain sorts of information that can, uh, very small amounts, of particular types of information that can ever leak out. Um, the, um, there are events, I think, in the past that are analogous to the technological singularity. The most recent one that's analogous is not technological. It's the rise of humans within the animal kingdom. And so there's a lot of things when people ask me about the singularity, I'd first of all say, I don't know before the reasons I just finished explaining. And I say, but reasoning by the rise of humankind within the animal kingdom, such and such, which may or may not be right, but at least I'm reasoning from an analogy that I think is, an, is a, a, a true analogy. Um, and even though the world after the singularity is unknowable, uh, if you believe what I just said, um, the run-up to the singularity is, is not. It could be largely knowable and I think pretty evidently very important to us humans. And so I have something I call the pa paths to the singularity. Um, these are not separate scenarios. That's, in fact, that's a good reason for, not call, for calling them paths instead of sub-scenarios or something like that. I think all of these five paths are, are progressing. Most of them are progressing like gangbusters. That is very powerfully and robustly. Um, I think they probably will all succeed. Um, and they each have their kind of peculiar flavor. Uh, I believe that in, that, in fact, these five paths are all mixed together. Uh, and, it's, and it is artificial for me to try to spread them apart like this. On the other hand, that makes it easy, easy to, uh, you know, to, to look at and investigate each of them uh, um, for what it is. And so let me go over these uh, briefly. Uh, there's the classic artificial intelligence path. And uh, this has uh, been a lot of science fiction about this. Uh, it's, um, uh, I'm, I, the simplest version, the classic version of it is artificial intelligence in, in standalone uh, computers. Uh, if this happened, one interesting question about it would be how fast it happened. If it happened, if it happened literally overnight, which actually is not implausible, again, going back to the analogy with uh, humans uh, amongst the animal kingdom, our development would probably look pretty, pretty fast from the standpoint of the rate that biological evolution was otherwise going in the animal kingdom. Our ability, once we had, had the sorts of minds that we have now, to make changes in the environment was strikingly fast. Uh, whether it gets cold, that's bad news for a buffalo. He has a couple choices. He can move to where it's warmer, or the buffalo can die. That, and that second is not, is, is not quite a joke, because uh, evolution and natural selection itself uh, would probably select for buffaloes as a race that had thicker coats. On the other hand, what would happen if a caveman, or excuse me, an early human, um, had trouble with the weather getting colder? He has those first two options available to him, but he has a third option available if there's any buffalo nearby. So. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if these events happen very, very fast. And I don't mean them to be as, as bloody as what I just implied, but happening very fast is uh, a real possibility. 
And one, one distinction I make is between what I call a soft takeoff and a hard takeoff. I'm just trying to emphasize we're talking about things getting better in some sense, but a hard takeoff is probably something we don't want. That's where things change much faster than any human thought about them or, or human ability to ameliorate the changes um, happen. The, the worst type of hard takeoff might be an, an arms race. Imagine two nations who both reckon that a superintelligence is a, is a game winner, an absolute game winner. So they both have secret programs to make a superintelligence. And they both have spies that reveal to them that the other side is doing the same thing. And their spies are really good, like some of the spies, or the, well, their spies are fairly good, at least like, like it was in some of the nuclear secrets in, in the mid-century of the 20th. Um, and so each side is getting the other side's secrets and getting the other side's schedule and speeding up their own schedule because the other side is doing so well. Until some Friday night, both sides realize that by 8 o'clock the next morning, somebody is going to win. And so you can imagine this race to the finish line, throwing overboard precautionary steps um, and, and fail-safes on both sides. That's something that's sort of tailor-made to give you a hard takeoff. Um, so hard takeoffs look naturally like a, a bad idea to me. The um, next one on my list is where we humans um, improve our human computer interfaces to the point where we are, we are effectively superhuman as individuals. So I call that the IA uh, approach for intelligence amplification. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean you look any more Borg-like than I look with my eyeglasses and my little speaker here that I have wrapped around my ear. Um, uh, but the wireless connection would give, give the participant this, this superhuman uh, uh, intellect. A uh, good friend of mine, Hans Moravec, has been talking about this for a long time. And I remember in the early 80s, we were at an AI conference, and he says, you know, this singularity stuff that you're talking about, Ver and about it being unknowable and all that stuff, um, I, I, you know, I buy almost, I buy all the facts that you're talking about. But the thing is, um, if you're one of those people who can increase their own intelligence, um, then they will go along this exponential getting smarter and smarter. And then he smiled and he said, I intend to ride that curve. <laughs> so he says, for me, this improvement in, in technology will be one smooth and, and not singularity at all. I'm understanding at every point and it's just a natural progression of me becoming smarter and smarter than humans. Um, or, you know, pre pre-singularity uh, humans. Um, that actually is a very, I, I think most people, pro probably even more than the idea of uploads, mo most people actually grab onto that idea of intelligence amplification and it, it, really looks, um, it really looks pretty nice. I do have some friends who think that intelligence amplification is really, really scary because they know how mean-spirited people can be and they're afraid that some of their friends will beat them to it. Um, the uh, biomedical path is one that you actually uh, uh, hear a lot about. Um, and I, I, I think that's actually going pretty well too, except uh, I would caution uh, against mistaking the reinvention of amphetamines for a genuine uh, boost in human intelligence. We seem to invent, reinvent things like opiates and amphetamines about every 30 years. Uh, you know, finally a non-addictive uh, painkiller. Uh, or finally, a non-addictive a non way to stay awake for 36 hours at a time. And um, on the other hand, if it's something that can give me the memory, uh, it can give me a photographic memory, hmm, I think, I, I, I think actually there would be people who would kill for even a good memory. Uh, and, and that, a, a genuine advance along, that, along those lines would really, I think, would really take off. It, uh, and it could probably survive some pretty bad side effects before it would before would uh, uh, find a lot of uh, uh, opposition. The digital Gaia path, I think, is uh, a, a path that's really worth looking at seriously. And like the biomedical path, I don't see any particular impact uh, for the nature of science fiction, but it has a real impact in, in, in other things. And that is, when you look around you at, at, the, at the world, um, we see more and more embedded microprocessors. Econo there's an economic reason for that. They make the devices that they inhabit so much cheaper. Just look inside a printer. All the moving parts, I mean, not, 
there aren't a lot of moving parts. Microprocessors substituting for that. And we're getting into an era where the microprocessors are networked. So one of the questions that came up at, at the honors class session this afternoon uh, was, uh, how bad would it be if all the computers just stopped? By the way, that's another great science fiction story from the early 20th century, 1909. The machine stopped. I can't remember the name of the author right now. I didn't put that in my cheat sheet. Um, and he was a guy who, he was a, liter he was a literary type guy. You know, I don't think he ever wrote science fiction. He was literary. He really didn't like H.G. Wells and all the techno-optimism of H.G. Of Wells. So he wrote this terrific story as a science fiction story. And the title of the story is The Machine Stops. And he perfectly captured the sort of situation. And in many ways, the story is not averagely remembered nowadays. Um, it's an example of how you can be dead right, but so far before your time that you're kind of ignored. Uh, and so I really recommend the, reading The Machine Stop. The, the Machine Stops. It was either The Machine Stops or The Machine Stopped. Good enough for Google days. Um, we are in a situation now where with our highly networked and optimized uh, systems that if, if, if our computers stopped, we would be in, in a very great bind. Even more, if you look at the situation, the reason why I call this the digital Gaia scenario, is that it is a machine ecology. It does not need any, any individually superhuman machines, but the ensemble together actually is very much like a, a concepts from animism where you have reality itself waking up and there being a form of identity to certain areas. Uh, and it is possible to Im imagine terrific types of disasters. Uh, in fact, it, I don't think it takes any special um, ex extravagant fiction uh, to, to write a story about the future in which the future itself uh, has the same robustness and rock-solid nature that we presently associate with financial markets. <laughs> um, if, you have, if you have machine mediation of physical processes in the real world, undertaken um, for simplicity and to optimize things, like if you want a cab, you just walk out in the street with the thought in your mind that you want to get a cab and there's a cab there, things like that. Something that is, is, there's a tremendous economic motive for. Um, on the other hand, that means the sort of glitches that we now see in speed trading and the sort of glitches that we now see propagate through uh, certain sorts of computer networks can now propagate through the real world. And this is a, this is a sort of threat and a sort of scenario that is hardly, hardly considered at all. I said earlier in the talk that it was important that uh, uh, we have um, different, that, that people uh, realize that uh, there are different possible scenarios and that, that they're not all going to exist wholly developed in one person's head. Uh, thinking about these sorts of scenarios and trying to, trying to find some way of getting good enough fallback positions so that things sort of muddle through if you get system failures is a, an enormously important thing. I deliberately postponed to, to be the last item in the path so the singularity, the path that in some ways is going the best, in some ways is the weakest, um, but is, is um, arguably the most, uh, the, the one that uh, capitalizes on human strengths uh, as, they, as they exist uh, the most, and that is the internet path. Humanity, its networks, its computers, and its databases uh, become sufficiently effective to be considered a, a, uh, a superhuman being. Um, Right now, the internet is uh, almost a test bed for engaging the creativity of humans as a whole. And uh, for all the dangerous things that there are about having a large population of humans on Earth, you know, 6 billion, 7 billion, 8 billion people, one thing about it is that if these, are, if these include people that are educated and, and moderately happy and and, and, and some sort of minimum standard of living, um, you have a brain trust there. It is a brain trust that trumps all intellectual institutions of the past. And, and, and it it's, consists of people who, for the most part, are good-hearted and have literally hundreds of millions of specialties 
that they are that they are concentrating on. Now, many of them are just in, interested in in they're, they're all interested in their in their self interest. Many of them, it's very narrow. In other cases, they do have an external interest, like um, Indian pottery, or um, or some aspect of astronomy, uh, or the movies, or whatever. You can see this represented in the, in the slam dunk wins, such as as Wikipedia amounts to. So, organ, uh, the the organization that the internet allows in that sort of situation is one that is uh, beyond all these big government programs that we deal with, and um, I, I go on to this at great length in in, a, in this, uh, this 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 link to the new populisms, um, but. I think that this is a, 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 an avenue uh, by which this, the serious scenarios and the science fiction um, can, can blend with new creative mechanisms, mechanisms that are coming out every day in the way that the internet is being used with, uh, with people. So this situation, I think, is powerful enough that as we go forward to the uh, singularity, that there's a real chance that we will be able to usher in the other species of mind on the list in such a way that uh, actually they all, they all can uh, uh, benefit each other and, and make for a relatively uh, safe and, and uh, surely survivable uh, outcome. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Your mic is up here. If you're talking about the... Thanks. Um, is it on? Yep. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. That was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, now if I can get my iPad to work right. So there's a couple things that I'd like to say first. Uh, the first one is the number. The, the phone number that you can text to uh, is 401-284-444. Or you can email to uh, HC questions for honors course question, uh, singular, I'm sorry, HC question at gmail.com. There are a number of people watching online, so that's for those. You should all have cards out there too with these numbers on them. Okay, so we've had some questions uh, submitted, uh, and let me, uh, oh, and there was also a comment from somebody in the audience uh, that the, uh, that the, the machine stops is E.M. Foster. E.M. Yes. E.M. Foster, 1909. Uh, so I assume Google is working hard out there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first question is, how did you conceive the concept of willing suspension of disbelief? Um, it goes back a long way. I actually looked it up before I came here to talk. It, it, you know, it's, it's Coleridge. And uh, apparently, he was kind of in the same bind the science fiction writers were that he says, you know, people don't like fantasies, at least when he was thinking of writing fantasies. And so he, he, he felt in essays that he had to do some justification for that. Um, and to me, it, it actually is, is literal. It, 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 the individual parts of it do, do say what it is. It's willing in the sense that the reader can either do it or not do it. Um, and if they do do it, it's not because they believe what you're saying. In fact, I think one, uh, one liberating aspect of, of fiction uh, from, say, 1800 to the present is the principle of authorial disbelief. That is, uh, there was a time, if you were going to write something crazy, that it was sort of incumbent upon you to believe it. You know, if you look at stuff that was, that was written, you know, say, in the year 1000, um, the uh, religious tracts and stuff like that, there was sort of the sentiment that the guy writing it believed it. When you get into the 18th century and the 19th century and, say, Shelley and stuff like this, uh, the person really didn't have to believe it. And this actually gave them a lot greater variety of stuff. Similarly, for the readers reading that thing, um, they want to like the story well enough that they're willing to suspend their disbelief even though they still, um, still uh, don't really believe it. 
This leaves then going beyond, I, I think, where Coleridge was. This, in the case of science fiction, leads you to a situation where the person is willing to entertain the idea. And if they're, if they're a person who themselves is imaginative, they often can come up with, with explanations um, for the thing that was unbelievable. And this may be a benefit to them and, and to the world as a whole. Okay, here's another question. Um, with computer programs on the net like chatterbots and things like that, could computers on the net learn from themselves and take <laughs> off without human Where did help? that question come from? <laughs> I can't imagine where that question came from. Um, uh, Peter has this example of two chatterbox programs that were pointed at each other. You take to, that! You have to tell me what a chatterbot is. Oh, box. explain to me what chatterbox is. Well, no, you no, no, you say. <laughs> you, you are so, the person who... So a chatterbot's a program that uh, you ask the program a question or you have a conversation with the program and it'll respond to you. And for example, there are now these programs that are connected up to Wikipedia. Uh, so you'll say something to the program. The program will then go and look up on Wikipedia, <laughs> come up with an answer and feed it back to you. And they're learning how to talk from millions and millions of conversations. Uh, and so they talk back to you. So this question well, Okay, here, my, my, my feeling is in the present era, and you may disagree, but in the present era, that would be a serious loss, a, a serious lose situation. <laughs> that the conversation, ex except, for the, except for the fact that uh, I, think, I think a human watching such conversation would use their own intelligence to impute some subtle double meaning to the stupidities that were being <laughs> traded back and forth. So I think in that sense, actually, you might be able to impress somebody with dueling chatterboxes. Yeah, by the way, you can all listen to these two chatterbots talking on an NPR program. Go back about a week ago and look up robots or something like that. It's really quite amazing. Um, okay, what do you think would happen if the singularity would result in a near infinite growth in population? Uh, it depends on what you mean by, first of all, I, you know, the term near infinite is a math type. It, 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 I can't really deal with it. <laughs> and, and the, uh, the, but the other thing is what you mean by population. If you just mean a, a bunch of human level AIs, then it might, the world might not look any different at all. And this results actually in some really scary, and, and, and I have a story called The Cookie Monster, which is, is about the, that sort of cheap labor. Um, it, it effectively means that the price of human labor goes to zero. We're not talking about superhuman intelligence here. We're just talking about the ability to make human level AIs in very large numbers. And so you could do some extraordinary things. You know, you could have gangs of these things working to solve certain problems. Also, um, you know the typical thing you do if you're a kind of a, a, a computer hardware person, you get this computer that was cheap, and then you try to run the clock faster on the computer. It's called overclocking. And so you can buy a cheap computer and run it four times as well, three times as fast, two times as fast. You didn't pay a dollar more. Of course, most of the time you fry your computer, but it, you know, it's, 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 it's cheap if you luck out and get a good CPU. So if you have a human, human level AI and you overclock it, is that superhuman? If you, if you, had, if you had a friend who could do, could do white collar jobs 10 times as fast as a human, would that be superhuman? Uh, he might be a newspaper reporter, he might be a science fiction writer. Uh, in any case, it's pretty intimidating. Um, and Robin Hansen had a great article in, in the IEEE Spectrum. Uh, we had an is issue all about the singularity, and I got to write all the sum-ups. It was great. Uh, but there was a lot of good essays in, in, in that issue, and some of them were actually quite anti-singularity and angrily anti-singularity. There was one angrily anti singularity singularity one there. So that, that's also inter interesting reading. In your view, are the disruptions that we see in today's job market precursors to the singularity? I don't know. I hope not. I mean, we have enough, we have enough problems. I, I think actually the proximate reason for our problems is not that. Long, longer range, the notion of true white collar unemployment it is a, it is a, a, a a scary uh, uh, thing. You know, in the old days, the white collar types and the academic types could just say, they didn't have to lose their objectivity. They could just say, well, don't you realize you, you can't make buggy whips anymore, but you can, you can make the horns on automobiles. I, I, they, nowadays, they are under assault, the white collar types. 
and um, the sort of rising tide uh, has already sort of shifted what it is to be a white collar worker. More and more, the the um, unre the irreplaceable human essence is is very pointed, and so you get jobs where you're kind of flickering around. You could imagine, and I'm not saying I'm happy with this, but you could Im you could imagine white collar. Uh, high class, high, white collar intellectual jobs being almost like piecework, where you get three minutes to be a human on this job, three minutes to be human on this job, and you get paid quite well because you know the machines can't do this stuff, but you can. And uh, so more and more, uh, th this sort of this sort of uh, fast changing of, of what of what intellectual jobs are like is is uh, well sort of upsetting to me. Uh. If a person could talk to an AI being, would they, the being or the human, appear to be super intelligent? I think he, I think, uh, uh, he could probably convince you of anything he wanted to convince you of. So in a way, it means it's sort of hard to talk to uh, something that was really a superhuman AI. I, I, I remember, uh, I'm, I'm blocking on, but Ken McLeod, I think, wrote a story where heroin, human heroin, she's really sharp, and she's up against a military AI. I don't mean, I don't mean like T, like Terminator, I mean a general. He's a general, he's actually running the other side strategically. And um, they actually have a telephone conversation, a video phone conversation. And he, and he comes across dressed up like a general. And he's playing all the head games, you know, the sort of dominance head games. And, and uh, I'm not sure whether she was impressed or not, but it was impressive to the reader because uh, the, the, the guy was up against the situation where it was just chit-chat and dominating in chit-chat. And he was actually very good at that. He was actually sort of running circles around her. I said, get off the phone, lady, get off the phone. He's going to play you. Um, whoops, sorry. So I think actually I've done several scary answers to the last few questions. And I want to back up and say, look at the last item on my list there, guys. Uh, doesn't need a government crash program, but there are, there are ways we can make this, I think, come out uh, very mellow uh, c compared to other ways. Using your definition, when does the singularity occur? Actually, I was asked that at the dinner party tonight. And I, I think for the different paths, there would be kind of different indications of that. One is if we get the intelligence amplification thing. If you wake up one morning and you and you know you just uh, you're starting to use this new user interface, and you say, "Oh, suddenly, oh, that stuff about relativity, that's so easy." And I just solved Fermi's Fermat's last theorem, and it's much simpler than Lyle's proof. And you know, if you start going like that, you're probably over the edge. <laughs> um, so that's that is uh, one way. There's also another thing that comes up, and that is. Uh, the singularity people are often accused of being like um, religious type things, and you know, uh, and you know what? When people make predictions of the end of the world, what happens when it doesn't happen? What do they say? Like you know, the world's going to end in the year 2012 or something like that. If it doesn't end in 2012, what do they say? What was that? Yeah, right. I made a mistake in the calendar. Um, there's actually something else that could happen with a the singularity. They may smile secretively and say it happened. And you didn't notice. <laughs> um, however, I promise that I will, I will never use that. If it, doesn't, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, if I don't think it's happening, or, or if I think it, whatever I think, I won't, I won't pull that one. So wait, did you answer that? Did you give a date? <laughs> I didn't. No, no. <laughs> I've, I've only given very probabilistic dates. Like I said, I'd be surprised if it happened after 2030. And also, there are trumping disasters that could happen, in my opinion. I mean, if the sun blows up, that'd probably stop it. <laughs> um, if, if, if actually, if, if we lost our technological infrastructure, which is very easy to imagine happening, that would push it back by several hundred years. Science fiction writers are really the first occupational group that was, po that was economically impacted by the singularity. Because we spent 20 years now trying to write stories where if we want to make them realistic, and they happen after the point where we think the singularity is happening, how do we explain that? Because there are readers out there who think it's going to happen. They say, how can you have this human, ordinary human character? Where are the superhuman intelligences? So we have all these tricks, you know, to prevent the singularity from happening. 
One is a big war. If everybody got killed or if the technological infrastructure went away, you know, that would really postpone things. So when I say I'd be surprised if it, ha it didn't happen, if it hadn't happened by 2030, I'm also leaving aside the possibility of other sorts of catastrophes, which I think the other sorts of catastrophes are much more scary if you're talking about existential threats. Okay, let's do one more. Uh, and this actually relates to the stuff you've just been saying. What will the role of literature be in the post-human era? Oh, um, actually, that depends on whether you're post-human or not. <laughs> I, think that, I think that really, and I, I, my hat is off to them if they exist, if they ever exist. And, and that is, think about what it must have been like to tell the first joke. It didn't have to be a good joke. <laughs> um, and, and nowadays, if you're into jokes and humor, you have essentially the whole historical record that you're competing against. That's really sad. You begin to get jokes that are just jokes on top of jokes on top of jokes. So the early post-human artists are really going to have a cool time, because anything they do will be great art as, as they understand it. Okay, well, I guess uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So um, uh, Werner will be out in the uh, lobby to, uh, to sign his books, um, and next week we'll have Anthony Atala who will be talking to us about regenerative medicine. Uh, I don't know if some of you people have seen the stuff on his website, the sorts of things he's do he does. Uh, one of the cooler ones is where he takes effectively a 3D printer, puts cells in it, and prints kidneys. <laughs> And uh, you laugh, he's doing it. And soon they'll be going into humans. Uh, and so come next week, same time, same place. And don't forget, next Monday night, you get a treat. Uh, Michio, Michio Kaku will be here uh, also talking about the future. Thanks again, Bernard. Oh, thank you. Yeah.